If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, we are going to be in James 5. Uh, James is a book in the New Testament. It's kind of further on down uh, in the New Testament. And I want to invite you to go to James 5, uh, beginning uh, with verse 13. And as Jeff said at the top of the service, we are wrapping up our sermon series today called Blessed to Be a Blessing. And we've been using uh, this book of discovering gifts uh, for 30 four weeks, a long time since the beginning of the year, really looking at how God has blessed us, how God has gifted us, um, not for our own personal edification, but over and over throughout scripture, we read, God says, hey, I have blessed you. Uh, I have gifted you so that you may give to others, so that you may bless others. That's why God put us on this planet, is so that we as the church, as the body of Christ, can be blessing those around us. And I love that we're finishing up with this whole idea of teamwork. And really this is where we began 34 weeks ago, looking at this idea that all of us, every single one of us, uh, are invited into this discipleship journey, but into the life of the church. The church is not a place where a handful of professionals or a handful of, of people, uh, volunteers, even the, the superstars, uh, you know, get to serve in ministry. But the church is really the place that Christ created for all of us uh, to engage. It requires all of us uh, to be engaged in the life of teamwork. So when I was growing up in Austin, Minnesota, many Friday evenings, uh, I would get on a bus uh, along with my friends, and we would go to Brownsdale, which was just kind of a little town next to Austin, and we ended up at the roller skating rink. Anybody go to the roller skating rink when you were a kid? You know, you go and it's kind of a big oval or a circle or something like that. But I have just great memories of going to the roller skating rink uh, in, in, in southern Minnesota where I grew up. And if you've been to the roller skating rink, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't been to the roller skating rink, um, just kind of play along with this. So here's how it works. What you need to know when you go to the roller skating rink is they kind of try and keep it interesting. And you've got a DJ and they play music, usually pop music. And, um, and so, you know, if you hear your favorite song or whatever, you go out and you, you know, roller skate to the music. If you hear a song that you don't like so much, you probably sit down or I, I, I don't know. But what the DJs do is to keep it interesting, they'll say, okay, everybody wearing red. And in Austin, Minnesota, red was our school colors. And so we oftentimes on Friday night, of course, would be wearing red. Everybody in red, go out on the floor and skate, okay? Then, um, and so everybody wearing red would go out on the floor and they would skate, then they would say something like, everybody who, you know, who can skate backwards, go out on the floor and skate. And I could not skate backwards, um, so I would sit down. But a lot of other people would go out there and skate backwards. And, you know, you've always got the show-offs doing what they do out on the uh, roller skating floor. Okay, couples. If you're a couple, it's couples skating. So all the couples would go out there, and we would watch them going, oh, man, Right? And they would just have their moment and somebody would, they would hold hands and skate together or somebody was going backwards and somebody was forward and you just kind of watch them skating out on the floor. All these different categories. And at some point in time in the night, the DJ would say, it's an all skate. Everybody out on the floor. And pretty soon, everybody, whether, you know, whatever you were wearing or whether you had a date or not or uh, whatever, you know, was going on, whatever tricks you could or couldn't do, everybody would go out onto the floor to skate. And I love the all skate because it was, there were so many people going around this oval or going around this circle that there were so many people, there was really, we all just were there. There was really not a chance to skate backwards or do a couple's skate or, you know, anything like that. Nobody cared what color you were wearing. It was a chance for everybody to go and be together on the skating floor. And I like that image as I think about teamwork and what it means to be the church. It's, it's, it's kind of like an all skate. This is who God has called us to be. Bring whatever you've got to the oval. Get into the game. Go out onto the floor. Nobody stands out in the church. Everybody's just going in this oval together in the same direction. 
And I think in many ways, this is the life of James. James, the half-brother of Jesus. And one of the things I love about James is that James spent at least half of his life, if not more, not following Jesus. James had greater proximity to Jesus for 30 plus years, 30 to 32 years of uh, his life. They grew up in the same house together and they spent all this time together. But James did not, he was not a follower of Jesus. He was not a disciple of Jesus. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, for over half of his life, he denied his brother. James had this incredible proximity to Jesus. He had this blessing. Can you imagine spending 30-some years with Jesus and not recognizing the blessing that James had? That was James. And yet, God used James in his life, opened his eyes, and invited James to share that blessing with others. So if you're in the book of James, uh, let's pray and invite God to just uh, speak to us through his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for James. We thank you, God, for the gathering of your saints today. The Lord, we indeed, uh, this might be a time of an all skate, a time for all of us to lean in. God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable. You are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, James was a popular name uh, in New Testament times, uh, a popular Jewish name. There were a lot of Jameses uh, that show up time and time again. And if you've read the Gospels, and I know that many of you have, uh, James uh, shows up uh, time and time again. And, and we shouldn't be surprised that James shows up because it's, James is actually a, a New Testament version of the Old Testament, Jacob or Jacob. And Jacob, of course, was a very famous uh, Jewish guy in the Old Testament. So uh, it's, uh, in Hebrew, James is Yaakov, and in Greek, it's Yaakobos. And you can kind of see, oh, I can kind of see how they got to James, Yaakobos. So it's a common name, or was a common name for Jewish people. As we read through the Gospels, we run across two James that kind of show up over and over. James, the son of Zebedee, right? The sons of thunder, James and John were brothers. And then we read about this other disciple of Jesus. His name was Alphaeus. So even two of the 12 disciples, their names were James. But that's not the James I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about James, the half-brother of Jesus. James, the son of Mary and Joseph. When we read the Gospels, we learn that Jesus actually had not just James, he had a bunch of siblings. Jesus was the oldest, of course. Then James, Joseph, which is kind of like uh, jo Joseph Jr., Joe Jr., that was his nickname, Joseph, Simon, Jude, who also wrote a book in the New Testament. And then it says he had sisters. So plural, we don't know their names, Scripture doesn't tell us their names, but, you know, plural, so he had at least two siblings. So um, Mary and Joseph, they had nine people in their family. It was a big family. Oftentimes when we think about the Holy Family, we think of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Well, that, they were a family, the three of them, for a while until they had a bunch more kids. Mary and Joseph had a whole other pile of kids, nine of them. So I want you just to kind of erase that kind of image in our minds of Mary and Joseph and Jesus for just a moment, the Holy Family. And I want you to think about what it was like for Jesus and Mary and Joseph and, and all nine of them. I mean, that's how they spent most of their time together. And I can about think of, uh, you know, this, this family of nine living in Nazareth in this little village. They're driving a homeschool van, probably a 12-passenger van, 
doing what they do. I mean, that's, that's how big their family was. And so even though they got a lot of people in their family cruising around, doing life together, they probably lived in a small house together. Nine people kind of on top of each other. And you can just about picture or, or think of all the noise that was going on. I would imagine it was very chaotic. And all the boys, when it was work time, Joseph would go to the workshop, maybe even attached to the house or close by. All those boys would follow Joseph to the, wood sh- um, the workshop. And they would do what they would do. And, and uh, the, the girls would probably stay with Mary and they would learn what they were supposed to be doing. And, and this just kind of went on uh, for a long time. And you're thinking, wow, nine, nine, nine in their family. They must have been one big happy family, right? I'm not sure they were. I'm not sure they were one big happy family of nine. Because they were human beings like you and me. And they had their family issues, family dynamics. And they were kind of on top of each other all the time. And I want to invite you to just think what it was like to be James, the brother of Jesus. Older brother, all these younger siblings. He's the next oldest after Jesus. I think it was kind of rough for James. Because his older brother never did anything wrong. See, they all grew up with the same temptations. These kids all grew up with the same temptations that you and I grew up when we were children. And occasionally, they would fall into these temptations. But not Jesus. He was the perfect child. He never fell into temptation. And I think from a human standpoint, we can kind of understand. Maybe you had that older sibling who was the perfect child. That was James, and maybe you really get James. And we can think about not just the the, the temptation, but all the sin that those, those kids got into, but not Jesus. Jesus never sinned. He never did anything wrong ever. And I think we can appreciate what it was like for James especially having this perfect brother. Everybody was always doing stuff and and messing up and making mistakes and falling into temptation, but not Jesus. He was the perfect child. And I think it's not difficult for us to just kind of stretch our minds and think, gosh, Jesus never gossiped. Jesus never swore. Jesus never got angry. He never called anybody by me names. Jesus probably sat at the dining room table and never complained about the meal oh, mom, this is awesome, right? Just every time, it's just like, really? I mean, Jesus just never, I'll bet you his room was clean all the time too. I mean, he was that older brother. He just never did anything wrong. And I'm thinking, James must just been like, are you kidding me? This is my brother, Mr. Perfect. He never does anything wrong. Which means mom and dad are disciplining the other kids, but not Jesus. Jesus never got disciplined. Oh, there was the time that Jesus stayed at church too long. Remember that? Can you imagine? Jesus, you stayed at church too long. That's not okay. I mean, how many of you have disciplined your kids over that one? That was his one error with mom and dad. The one time where he got a reprimand from mom and dad. I mean, James, that's the house James has to grow up and live in. His one mistake his brother makes, or the one sin or whatever you want to call it that his brother made is he stayed in church too long. I think it was rough. I think it was really rough for James. Because you know Jesus was the favorite child. And I don't think Mary, I think they were great parents. But either they said it or they thought it. They looked at James and the other siblings, all those kids, and said, why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? You know, they said that or they thought it, or at least the kids were like, man. I mean, growing up under a roof, always having to compare yourself to Jesus. And so I, I, I put on the slide there this family of nine, and I tried to do a halo. Can we do the one with the halo, Anne? Do we have the halo around Jesus there? There he is. Okay, there's the halo. And then there's James over there in the hoodie. He's not very close to Jesus in the moment. 
because it's rough to be next to Mr. Perfect. Now, you also got to understand, in ancient times, Families lived together for a long time, and they, they, they worked together. And we know that, that Jesus was uh, like his dad, a, a carpenter, a mason, some kind of uh, blue-collar worker. And so Jesus lived with his family either in the same house or, this, uh, or nearby for 30 years. I mean, it wasn't just at 18, see you going off to college. It just kept going on and on and on. For 30 years, James had to put up with Mr. Perfect under his house. So I would imagine the day that Jesus came home and put down his, his wood mallet and said, hey, I'm going into ministry. I'm leaving the, the carpentry business. James is like, finally, he's leaving. I am so glad. He was just super excited. I, I think, I don't know, scripture doesn't tell us. I would be happy. And you would think maybe for the next three and a half years, as Jesus is doing ministry, he's teaching and he's healing. Oh, maybe then J James's eyes are going to be opened. Maybe then James is going to be like, oh, wow, isn't my brother neat? I don't have to hang out with him. And he's you know, popular in the community and he's a great preacher and he, he heals uh, people and he does some, some really neat stuff. You'd think, oh, then at that point in time, James must have been like, oh, I've got such a great brother. You'd be wrong if you thought that. Because even during three, three and a half years of ministry, James still did not believe in his brother. He did not trust in his brother. He never became a disciple of Jesus. And this went on and on and on. And you're thinking, well, maybe during Holy Week, Maybe when Jesus was arrested, maybe James or one of the siblings showed up in the courtroom as a way of giving testimony before the judge. Hey, he's my brother. He's actually a pretty good guy. He's actually really nice to people. And so when Jesus stands before Caiaphas and, and the other uh, leaders standing trial, nobody from his family shows up to give a character witness for him. Are you kidding me? They're not there. Scripture is completely silent. And then after Jesus was convicted of blasphemy, of claiming to be God, they sentenced him to death on a cross. And then maybe you're thinking, well, that's maybe when J James started to believe in Jesus. His, his heart was changed, and so at least he showed up for the execution. But at the cross, James and his siblings were not there. And then maybe you're thinking, well, okay, G J Jesus is now dead. Maybe James and the siblings, everybody got together to plan the funeral. Call the funeral home. Nope. Is he going to take Jesus' body off the cross? Nope. Silence. There's going to be a funeral. They're going to lay his body in a tomb. Maybe James will be helpful there. Still not there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, end their description of Jesus' life. And James is not anywhere to be seen, or the siblings. She's like, whoa, that's rough. Living your entire life without your siblings. And on occasion, when people did Talk to the siblings about Jesus. Scripture tells us, I went by this, John 7, even his own brothers did not believe him. And then in Mark 3, 21, when his family heard about this, meaning he upset the religious leaders, they went to take charge of him and they said he is out of his mind. That's what Jesus' brothers and James thought of him. So in the book of Acts, picks up the story after the resurrection. We learn about all that's going on, and Jesus is on the earth for 40 days. And we read about how he ascends back to heaven on the Mount of Olives. And then there's 120 followers of Jesus who go back to Jerusalem. They go to the upper room to wait for the Holy Spirit. And this is what Acts 1.13 says. When they arrived, 
the 120, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, uh, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. He's, James keeps coming up here. They all joined together in constantly in prayer along with the women and, the Mar and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. What happened? How is it that all of a sudden, J Jesus' brothers, James, all of them were there? James, Joseph, Simon, Jude, and it says the women. I think it was Jesus' sisters too. How is it just, just here they are, 40 days after the resurrection. James is all of a sudden showing up. And they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. Well, the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us what happened. Paul tells us when, when James started believing. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, and this is what the Apostle Paul writes. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. You guys, you're church people, you know this. After that, Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then Jesus appeared to James and all the apostles. And Paul says, last of all, Jesus appeared to me. So at some point in time, after Jesus rose from the grave, he found his family. He found his brothers and his sisters. And they knew that he had been dead. And he appears to them. And it was in that moment when they had experienced the resurrected Christ, only then did they believe in Jesus. I mean, they had all those years of proximity close to Jesus, and they denied him. But in that moment when they experienced the resurrected Jesus, they're like, ah, he really was who he said he was. And I love at this point in time that there's this miracle, this miracle of belief. And I think anytime someone experiences the resurrected Christ, when Jesus shows up at your house or wherever you're at and you experience the resurrected Christ and you put your faith in him to believe, it's a miracle. I think every single one of us who've put our faith and trust in Jesus, in that moment, it's a miracle from God because we can know all about God. We can spend lots and lots of time with God, but until we actually step out and put our trust in Jesus, it is a miracle that God is doing. And, and I think Scripture could be like, and then on that day, James believed. And be like, that's a great end of the story, right? James finally believed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That'd be a great end of the story. We could just leave it at that. But that's not the end of the story for James. Because when James believed, he responded to the gospel. He responded to the gospel. He responded to Jesus. Because when we put our trust and our faith in Jesus, our lives cannot be the same. When we believe in Jesus and, and we've been run over by the grace train, we have to respond. We have to do something with it because it changes us so much. And that's certainly the case with James. Sometimes people tell me that, you know, they believe in Jesus, but their lives don't look any different than anyone else in the world. Or they'll say that they believe and trust in Jesus, but they just don't go to church or they're not religious or, you know, whatever they're doing. Folks, I'm here to tell you that's impossible. You cannot experience the resurrected Christ. You cannot experience Jesus and your life not be changed and putting Jesus at the very center. You are so turned upside down that you can't help but want to share your faith with others in the world. And so what did James do? He got involved with a local church. That's what Jesus' followers do. 
is they engage in the life of the local church. And James got involved of the local church in Jerusalem, and he got uh, involved with the prayer team, and the worship team, and the scripture team. James served at the church on Sunday morning. James joined a life group and got together with other people in that particular church. James gave very generously financially to his local church. This is what Christ followers do. This is what disciples of Jesus do, is they engage in the life of the church. This is how we respond to the gospel. We don't just keep going on with our lives. We're like, no, I'm getting involved with the church to make him known, and I'm going to gather together with God's people. The church that James got involved with was called the Jerusalem Church. And it was in Jerusalem. They were not very creative back then. It's like, okay, this is the church. And it was primarily a group of Messianic Jews, Jewish people who had become followers of Jesus. And so as the church, they're getting together, it's very chaotic, they're trying to figure out what to do, uh, how to care for others, how to proclaim the good news of, of the resurrection of Jesus to those around them. They're like, oh yeah, what did Jesus say again? Oh yeah, um, go and make disciples to the end of the earth. Oh, we better do that. So all the disciples, all the apostles, they fanned out to all parts of the world. They're like, we got to go. We got to, you know, share Jesus with others. That's not James's story. James stayed in Jerusalem. He looked at all the other disciples and said, okay, you guys go. You guys scatter. Go and make disciples and plant churches in all these places. I'm going to stay here in Jerusalem. And so James became a a leader in the early church. James actually was the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church for about 30 years. He was the steady guy. And, And so these disciples or the apostles, they would go out, they would make disciples, plant churches, and then they would come back and report on what's going on. You can read about this in the Acts of the Apostles. And there's James, they come back, and and even the Apostle Paul goes out, and, you know, he's doing some stuff, and then he comes back, and he has some consultation with James. This is how significant James was in the life of the early church. Now, in the early church, the first church, the Jerusalem church, they faced a couple different challenges, three of them, really, Um, famine and poverty. And again, you can read about all this in the Acts of the Apostles. People were poor. People were struggling, and the church needed to respond. And they probably didn't have an outreach team like we have an outreach team. Their whole church was kind of the outreach team. It says that they shared everything they had with anyone who had need. And so one of the biggest challenges in the early church was famine and poverty. Then there was persecution. They had to figure out, how are we going to live together? How are we going to engage in the culture around us? You think you've got persecution in your life with the culture today? Nothing compared to how the Jerusalem church, the early church, had to deal with, navigate a culture that was absolutely hostile towards them. But I think the greatest challenge that James and the Jerusalem church had to face was false teaching. There were false teachers. They would go out, and they would hear all sorts of false teaching. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes through the years, I've kind of had to figure this out. I think the the false teaching and the bad stuff happens out there. And it's always confusing and troubling for me when the bad stuff happens in here, in the house, in the church. But the truth is, we all know this. There's false teaching in the church, and there was false teaching in the church back then. One of the best examples, I think, uh, is in uh, Acts 15, where they've got this problem. This problem of these Christians gathering together, and, and the apostle Paul shows up, and he says to James, James, we got a problem. There's false teaching in the church. And the false teaching is simply this. People want, uh, the, the Jewish people, they want the Gentiles to become circumcised. Before they can become followers of Jesus, they have to do this thing called circumcision. So they, they, they called a council. It's called the Jerusalem Council. Big debate. People, you know, yelling and screaming and throwing chairs and, and all that stuff. And like, what are we going to do? And it says that James stood up as the senior pastor and he said, guys, Jesus taught us that salvation comes by grace. Grace through faith, not any extra works. 
And what they were trying to do, the false teaching, was to do works in the life of the church. And this is how you're saved. James settled the matter. But it isn't it interesting that for the past 2,000 years, we continue to wrestle with this same false teaching. I mean, 500 years ago, this was at the heart of the Reformation. Grace plus works. And at the time, the works were called indulgences. I mean, this is what hacked off Luther so much. He's like, that's not in the Bible. Jesus didn't talk about works. He talked about grace alone. So the church got blown up again. They have this big argument. What is it? Grace plus works or grace? And the reformers said it is grace alone. The matter gets settled again. But did it? Because here we are 500 years later and we continue to see this false teaching in the life of the church. And I know many Christians are confused about what they have to do in order to be saved. We have to constantly remind one another the teachings of Jesus are by grace alone through faith alone, not anything that we do. And this still continues to be one of the biggest heresies and false teachings in the life of the church, even today in 2023. So those are the challenges that James ran into in the early church that we continue to run in today. Same issues, right? They just look a little bit different. So a few years go on, uh, go on and uh, about 57, 58 AD, um, the Apostle Paul comes back. They have some more uh, church conversation, consultation with James. And then all of a sudden, James disappears from the books of history. We don't really know. Scripture doesn't tell us what happened to him. Now, there is some church tradition that tells us that about five years after that consultation, the Jewish leaders got a hold of James. They took him up to the top of the temple, to the roof of the temple, and threw him off. And after they threw him off to the ground, just to be sure that he's dead, everybody picked up rocks and stoned him. That's what church tradition tells us, how James' life ended. So when we think about James, he was a really important person in the life of the church. And before you came into worship today, and maybe I came up to you and said, hey, who was the first leader of the church? Who was the first pastor of the church? You might be like, well, St. Peter, right? First Pope. Peter was certainly a leader in the church, but he was not the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church. You might be thinking, well, the Apostle Paul, I mean, he wrote so many books in the New Testament. You might even be like, well, maybe Matthew or, or Luke or John, you know, one of the disciples who were so faithful for those three and a half years to follow Jesus. You'd be wrong. The first pastor, the first church was James the brother, the half-brother, Jesus. And maybe the reason why you didn't know that today is because James wasn't drawing attention to himself. James wasn't the guy who was creating a church or overseeing a church, making it all about him. In fact, James worked really hard to do the exact opposite. He was so uh, focused on the all skate of the church. He was so focused on lifting up and equipping the body of Christ that nobody really knew. Oh, by the way, who is the senior pastor here? I don't know. I think it's James. Isn't that great? I love this about James. He was a pastor. He was a pastor's pastor. He, you know, pastor just, um, it, it, it's a Greek word, and it simply means shepherd. And what does a shepherd do is they take care of the sheep. They, ca they take care of the flock. They're caretakers. They're, they're ones to, to watch out and help others. They're, they're to pay attention to the scripture, to the theology, so that the sheep don't go astray. That's the role of a pastor. This is what James did. 
is he took care of the congregation in such a powerful way, and yet he never drew attention to himself. And so James wrote this book, uh, more like a booklet, uh, in 44 AD. It's actually the first book in the New Testament, and then it was Galatians after that, uh, that Paul wrote. And it's just five chapters. And the book is filled with all sorts of ideas of what it means to be a team, what it means to be the church, what it means to be together and live out uh, our calling in this world. And some, some of you are like, finally we're getting to the scripture text this morning. James 5, here we go. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of our Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to the priest, the pastor. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens uh, gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, someone... If someone should wander from the church, pick up the phone and call the pastor. If someone should wander from the church, call the elders. If one of you should wander from the truth, someone in the pew should bring that person back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I love that James over and over does not draw attention to himself. He's like, you're the church. Act like it. Take care of each other. Serve in the world together. Folks, this is an all skate. This requires all of us to get out on the oval, get out on the circle, and go in the same direction. And sometimes I hear from people, well, I don't know, I've got kind of a background What I need you to hear this morning is that God doesn't care about your background. No matter how much you've sinned, no matter how much your life has been filled with brokenness, God can use all sorts of people. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was a coward. Jacob was a thief. Joseph was a convict. Moses was a murderer. Samson was a bully. David was an adulterer. Solomon was a womanizer. Elisha had anger issues. Jonah was a racist. Jeremiah struggled with depression. Mary was a pregnant teenager. Peter was a hypocrite. John was power hungry. Matthew was an extortionist. Thomas was a doubter. The apostle Paul was a terrorist. And James, the brother of Jesus, just simply dismissed his brother for 33 years. If Jesus can use people like this, he can use you and me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these messed up people in Scripture. And God, week after week, we've looked at people who have had all sorts of gifts And somehow, some way, you have used them. And so, God, we think about James, how he could have missed it for so long that you are who you say you are. But yet, God, praise God, you open James' eyes. And you invite us to open our eyes to experience you. And so, God, we receive this today as a gift from you. And we invite you, Lord, to help us to respond and be the church together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.